that you can listen to the Backward Compatible Podcast anytime, anywhere, and any way you like. Subscribe and listen to us on SoundCloud, iTunes, Stitcher, or YouTube. Then, join the discussion. That's funny because that technically means that Luke Skywalker's father and grandfather are both lions. Does it? But this week on Backward Compatible... Jim is back in town for a visit, so he and Chris have a fireside chat with Will Parsons and Dr. Adam Bracken about Christmas-themed games and some other games that evoke the spirit of the holiday. The BackwardCompatible.com podcast starts right now. Backward Compatible listeners, um, we're here on uh, December uh, 21st, I believe. It is the right uh, For our holiday special. Uh, I'm Jim. Uh, we're here with uh, Chris, as usual. Hello, I'm Chris. Uh, we also have uh, Dr. Adam Bracken. Yo. And uh, we also have uh, Will. Hi, once again. Yep. The uh, Will. The Will. <laughs> the exactly. Will. Where the there's will. the Will, there's the way. <laughs> You realize that? So <laughs> oh, I died. I'll go ahead and uh, mute that. That's fine. Um, okay, so I believe we're we're going to talk about some Christmas games or Christmas related games, possibly, and just the concept of what is a Christmas game and what makes a Christmas game, because video games tend not to have Christmas themes, except for in in little DLC and a couple of little, you know, in Team Fortress you might get a Santa hat, but it's not really a Christmas game. World of Warcraft. Yep. Greatest Christmas content one. ever. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Nights into Dreams. Don't know that one. It is a Sega Saturn game by Yuji Naka, which has a very innovative flight mechanic, um, and also pretty much requires the analog controller. I don't care what anyone says. No, it does. It really <laughs> yeah, does. It does. It does. Um, but if you put the original disc in and you played with the game clock set to December 25th, it would switch to a Christmas theme, which they then expanded and released as a game. Christmas Nights. Aha. Uh-huh. And it was a fully Christmas based. I think even the dreams are technically kids dreaming around Christmas Eve. Well, all right. So, maybe another honorable mention would be uh, Animal Crossing. Uh, since oh, yeah. whenever it's Christmas Day, it's they've always got Christmas stuff in there. So. Yeah, yeah. Well, uh, Minecraft's done it a few times. Mm-hmm. The uh, the the creepers and stuff have shown up with Christmas hats or whatever. Um, Halloween. They they did a Halloween thing, but that's that's for another show. Okay. Mm-hmm. Halloween tends to be a lot more prevalent. Uh, Chris and I were talking about it earlier. That's true. Earlier today, there tends to be games, the entire theme of the game seems to be focused on um, Halloween and scares, and we associate games that are horror-related mm-hmm. and frightening and have a whole bunch of sort of um, monsters like zombies and, and werewolves and vampires and all that as being sort of Halloween-themed, even if they don't take place on Halloween. Mm-hmm. So uh, what, what I was hoping we could maybe do is try to figure out what are the the themes, the concepts that make that we associate with Christmas, so that we can think, well, what would be a Christmas game, even if it doesn't take place on Christmas, around Christmas, even if there isn't any snow or Santa Claus or reindeer or any of that sort of stuff? What sort of concepts do we think of when we think of Christmas? Like Halloween is all about scares and frights and monsters. Well, um, as long as we're not worried about you know offending people, because we offend. Less uh, less people when we talk about skeletons and stuff than, than whenever we talk about you know, Santa hats. Uh, <laughs> then a you know a happy Christmas Kwanzaa to you, <laughs> and uh, we'll charge on ahead. Okay. Yeah. That's fine. I think that was a that was a delay tactic because I don't have an answer. <laughs> <laughs> we we talked about it before, and we we're not we're certainly not trying to exclude anyone that doesn't celebrate Christmas. Um, but, but humbug. But in um, <laughs> you're actually wearing the hat. Yeah, it says it on my yeah. yeah. This is a this is a America based uh, podcast, and in America, lots of people, regardless of religious background, will celebrate Christmas. Um, I was telling before we started, I was telling Chris and Will that I had friends in high school that were Jewish and celebrated Christmas. Absolutely. So it's not. I don't think. I think it's sort of a transcendent American. Um, holiday. I know. Well, you were saying that even in Europe, they were. Yeah, Europe, they celebrate all of lots the of places. places. But it technically, 
kind of originates there. Mm -hmm. I mean, it originates from the solstice and then converted into Roman and then converted into or Christianized through Catholicism, etc., etc. So spread across there. A lot of it has moved less towards the religious aspect. Um, like I know Japan, it's mostly a commercial holiday. Mm -hmm. Korea is a mixture. Not here, it's not commercial at all in yeah. America. <laughs> well, I mean, <laughs> like, Japan, there's not really any kind of a religious connotation to it. Mm -hmm. It's completely commercial. Korea, it's like a half, or kind of a mixture due to the, the large Baptist and Catholic influence there. Um, and then in America, of course, it's just, it's huge. So, in all these places that many of them possibly don't have the necessarily the religious or the background, the history behind it, what are they like? What is what are the unifying themes with Christmas? Like what what are they? Like what what sort of descriptive terms would you use? When well, you I think, think of Christmas? I think one thing that we've kind of already established um, worldwide is sort of the aesthetic of Christmas. Mm -hmm. um, the Christmas tree is pretty prevalent most places I've seen. Maybe in not. Ecuador, in it Ecuador. is not due to the fact that snow and evergreens are not common. Mm. Um, the the decoration of choice uh, when I lived there was you take a, a large stick. You paint it white to huh. represent snow, uh -huh. and then you like put a, like Christmas lights on it. That's really it. So you'd go around town, and all the all the <laughs> because it's it's equatorial, uh -huh. the trees don't shed their leaves. Right, right. But any dead trees are painted white. Mm -hmm. That's really it. It's, yeah, Guatemala is the same way, except and actually they borrowed that from down south. But uh, th there really are quite a few evergreens because it's so mountainous. Mm -hmm. So they, they actually have both traditions. Except that the Christmas trees in Guatemala are the most perfect Christmas trees you will ever see on the planet. And if you don't look closely enough, you're going to seriously wonder if they're genetically modifying these things. <laughs> if you look closely, what you discover is that, in fact, no trees were harmed in the making of these trees. They're live, but what they do is they take branches and they pull them off of living trees so that they'll grow back before the next year. Sometimes they'll cut the tops of trees off, that sort of a thing. And then they'll take a very large stick, basically, what we would think of as a trunk, and they will cut notches in the branches and in the trunk and staple them to each other. Huh. The crazy thing is, you, wow. can, you can set this tree up in a tree stand, give it water, that sort of thing. It will last just as long as any other tree. Hmm. It works. It's crazy. And they're perfect. And totally, this is something that should happen in America. You that's call them green trees or something like that. Yeah, mm -hmm. I never even thought to do something like that. Mm -hmm. That's really cool. They it's, do it in farming all the time, but I didn't think about it for Christmas trees. Yeah, it's brilliant. It's, wow. Hmm. You just use a fake tree. Maybe. Well, there is that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> because because all that plastic, that's much better for the environment. Yeah, right? true. <laughs> you can make it out of aluminum. Yeah, you can. They have that's fully true. aluminum yeah. trees. They have fiberglass trees. Yes. So. Very, very true. My sister refuses to use anything but a real tree. Mm -hmm. So... Is is this uh, hmm? is this just personal preference or is oh, it? Oh, she she likes. I think I think it's most of it is smell. It's I think. the smell. Because from farther away you can't tell visually maybe, mm -hmm. but she really likes the smell, and I kind of like the smell too. So oh, yeah. I kind of like that. I think it sort of is something I associate with Christmas. Is they that sell that in aerosol cans though. That's true, but it's not, <laughs> it's not quite the same thing. You just get some pine salt and just hang your like a little like. <laughs> Car air fresheners, yeah, there ornaments you go. from the tree. As ornaments. You just yes. you just get a stick and just put like the air freshener on the stick and yeah. just kind of stick that. Spray paint it white and they then should, yeah. they should make the pine scented things and then cut them in the shape of mistletoe. It's like two for one. Oh, yeah. decorate your decorate your apartment. And then you're ready for New Year's. We've come up with Brilliant. all these great commercial ideas for Christmas. <laughs> we have. This is the true this is the true American celebration. Yeah, yeah. The, the spirit so, of Christmas. So we do have to admit then that at at, at least uh, there is the aesthetic aspect. Of you know the trees, oh clearly, and, and the lights, and, and, and the lights, and the you know maybe winter, mm. but there is also the commercialism aspect that mm. I think you can't get away from. So I think that we do kind of have to consider that mm -hmm. when it comes to thinking of games that might thematically be related to Christmas, right. especially when you're looking at from other cultures that celebrate Christmas that might focus even more so on the, the commercialism. Oh yeah, aspect. Santa like alone. What I was talking about, mm. you know, you get all these different um, multicultural interpretations of Santa. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah. And that's that's another one too that I think is is associated with the holiday season. Mm -hmm. um, I know I was thinking it's just something they play up in the World of Warcraft version too. Mm -hmm. The gift giving aspect mm -hmm. is um, I think highlighted in yeah. that version. I think giving if you're talking about themes, not Generosity just the aesthetic worldwide. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, that that's the spirit of Christmas is the giving. You know, the better to give than receive kind of a thing. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, King Wenceslas, whatever. Uh, <laughs> that. The idea of, of 
being benevolent, good cheer, joy, those kind of things, mm-hmm. even removed from their religious connotations, I, I think that those are ingrained in Christmas. I think so too. Yeah. The one that I that I like the most, I don't actually celebrate Christmas, but the mm-hmm. one thing I find in, it's not as common because it's overshadowed by generosity and then commercialism, um, but the elements of redemption around Christmas. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Usually when you watch any kind of a Christmas special, outside of the generosity, outside of everything else, there is redemption. Even in mm-hmm. even in the Doctor Who Christmas specials, each time he redeems someone else. Yeah. In uh, the episode with the Titanic, at the end of it, he redeems that um, the tour guide. Um, you watch Good King Wenceslas, it's the redemption of his throne, it's uh, redemption for the, the losses surrounding him. Um, I'm talking about a movie that came out that I, I realized suddenly that none of you have probably ever seen. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you kind of shifted from Doctor Who over into something uh, else there, right? Yeah, it's the movie Good King Wenceslas. It's an old movie. Um, he actually defeats the final villain. Uh, sorry, he doesn't. God defeats the final villain. Hmm. Um, because oh, like in loses. The Stand. King, Stephen King's The Stand miniseries from want, the, yeah okay <laughs> now, now I'm talking about stuff no one's yeah. seen <laughs> um, but no the, these elements of, of redemption that last through every kind of even the even the Christian faith the birth of Christ is about redemption mm-hmm. so wherever you go Christmas centers around uh, something being redeemed if you watch Christmas Carol any version of it the whole story is about redemption oh yeah yeah mm-hmm. you're, so. you're totally right I think that's a great point even the Grinch. That, Yep. Yeah. yeah, no, that really is a big part of, of the Christmas story, yeah, yeah, yeah. and that's a really good point to bring up. So so now the question is, along those lines, what games sort of have those themes? I mean, what games have, say, redemption as a central theme? Oh, Did man. Use that from, from Will's suggestion? That's, that's interesting. A bunch. <laughs> I mean, the, one of the big problems with games, just speaking globally, mm-hmm. um, is... It, when you when you approach it from a design standpoint, mm. is that you either have a character who is already larger than life and super heroic, and you're filling the shoes of that character, um, what we might uh, refer to as, uh, like, well, there's a couple different ways to look at it, but but an, a known character, if you will, you know, mm-hmm. I, I'm I'm going to be Solid Snake because everybody knows Solid Snake's awesome, right? Um, or you you fill this kind of empty character with yourself. So then the question becomes, as a designer, are you expecting someone to be Beowulf and be awesome? Or are you expecting someone to grow into that character? Because immediately you're, you're making a choice as a designer. Are they going to be following a classic hero structure or an anti-hero structure or something else like that? I bring that up simply to say, who's being redeemed? Is it the main character, in other words, the player character? Or is it a side character? I, I think... For me personally, I know, um, I would say normally when I'm thinking of, of the redemption, I would I would be thinking more towards main characters that are going through that sort of journey, that sort of character arc. But um, I do know that, for example, Lost Odyssey, um, it's a role-playing game for the Xbox 360. Have, I, have any of y'all played Lost Odyssey? I've heard a bit about it. I haven't um, played it myself. It was designed by uh, Sakaguchi, the guy that did uh, Final Fantasy originally, and mm-hmm. eventually left Square left oh, okay. Enix and sort of formed his own company known as Mistwalker, I believe. Um, Lost, Odyssey, uh, Lost Odyssey kind of flew under the radar, but it was a very interesting game in that you're, you play this guy who doesn't really remember much about himself, but he's lived, because he's lived so many lives, he's lived for... He's basically an immortal that's lived for kind of like, you know, multiple different lifetimes and mm-hmm. he's had various families and experiences and he's had to watch like his families, um, you know, glow, grow and die and that mm-hmm. kind of thing. So he kind of has, he's been kind of like a villain and a, you know, good person. Yeah, I think, I think you or Richard told me about this Richard, one. Richard this... loves it too. He's huge into it. He yeah. was here, he talked about it all day. Yeah, isn't this but... the one where like they actually brought in a bunch of like, or maybe a like famous short story writer to do all like that's, little yes, extra Yes, and that's actually was kind of what I was kind of getting into is mm-hmm. they brought in... What happened is that you would you would kind of unlock memories, I guess you could say. Mm-hmm. It's kind of the way it's presented, where you would go and you'd talk to someone in town, or like you'd see kids playing with a ball or something, and it would trigger a memory. And they would present it as in text with music playing, and it would just sort of, you would just read essentially a short story that was by a famous Japanese short story writer. Mm-hmm. Right? I cannot remember his name. I apologize for anyone that knows and is you know, shaking their fist at me right now. <laughs> but... It was um, each of the stories has some sort of you know central theme related to um, 
whatever you know element kind of triggered it. So you've got things, stories that you know, actually a lot of them are kind of very sad or bittersweet. Mm-hmm. Some of them are uplifting, but there are there is kind of this overall theme of um, sort of being redeemed as a person, as a character, kind of not necessarily even learning more about yourself, but kind of coming to terms with who you are and your place in the world and this sort of concept of, um, you know, it's not too late for you to kind of learn to be, sort of learn to find you find your place in the world and mm-hmm. where you kind of fit in with everyone. And I think, to me, it kind of does, I know I'm going a roundabout way talking about it, mm-hmm. but I think it kind of fits into the Christmas theme, especially with, I know personally I, I associate Christmas with family and, you know, friends and, and, you know, camaraderie and that kind of concept. And uh-huh. I think that that game, uh, to me, really does focus a lot. For example, one of the things you do in that game is you meet, you know, you kind of meet back up with, like, your grandchildren or something. And even though you're only, like, you know, seven, eight years older than they are um, physically looking, mm-hmm. you're actually much, much older. Right. So you kind of have that moment where you kind of are interacting with these people that are really much older than you are. And I think, I want to say you meet with, like, the woman who like was your wife or your daughter or something, but now she physically looks older than you. It's like a whole bunch of weird. Mm. There's a lot of like weird time stuff. I played yeah, it a while ago, but it's it's very interesting the way they present the story because it's done in a very different way. With this, the 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 parts of the game that stand out the most and are the most narrative heavy are really all text in a game that in a mm. genre, I mean, particularly Japanese RPGs, that has become so reliant on graphics and mm. voiceover and you know, visuals and sound and all this, and it really kind of boiled it all down to, no, we're just going to give you short stories, mm. and they're going to give you a message, and it's going to kind of, you know, inform your character and inform the world and mm. inform, give you some sort of, like, around a central theme of, you know, family and, and redemption, and it's 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 definitely different. But, yeah, I think for me, that would be a game that I would say I think has kind of those, those a, kind of Christmas-y a Christmassy... Themes theme to it, even mm. though it doesn't play take, take place in the winter, there mm. isn't any Santa Claus or mm. reindeer. Um, but yeah, I think there is a theme of prediction, especially with the main character. He's done, there's this whole thing of him being, obviously, he's been like a warrior in different times and all that kind of stuff, so it's mm-hmm. this theme of like him being a killer and trying to come, come to terms with what he had done and then how does he um, make up for that or how does he like face his, now his grandchildren, mm. how does he face like what he's done and how does he... Um, like, can he change the sort of person that he was, and can he redeem himself mm-hmm. with that? So yeah, I, I would say Lost Odyssey for me is a is a good example. Little yeah. Inferno. Hmm? Little Inferno. Little Inferno. Yeah, it's got it, a fireplace. Yeah, it, it is a fireplace. <laughs> the, the the meta story behind it's kind of interesting. Um, the context, if you will, you're a little kid. The world has apparently gotten farther and farther away from the sun. Mm. Um, so everything is cold and somebody's decided to market this and so you can order with little coins um, things to burn in your fireplace and the whole point of the game is to unlock and and discover all these weird combinations Hmm. and if you get to the end of it then basically they send for you and you can meet the head of the corporation and and it's very strange Hmm. it has kind of a Wizard of Oz ending but um, yeah it, it it has nothing to do with Christmas, but but just the to being at the fire and burning stuff and <laughs> and it going outside and then it's like snow and cold and all that stuff. You got to play it at at, at Christmas time because it has this again sort of redemptive quality to it. Mm. This idea of, of hopelessness, but it's okay. Hmm. So yeah, that's I've, my entry. I've not played. It. Is that is that like a PC? A PC? Yeah, it's a Steam game. Hmm. Uh, I think they have it on like Wii U as well oh, yeah. on the eShop. Oh, do they really? Mm-hmm. Oh, wow. Probably other places too, if I had to guess. Which reminds mm-hmm. me, uh, I was going to ask: has the uh, has the Lost Odyssey been re-released on Wii or anything? As far as I know, no. Like, it, it, you said it was a Sega game. No, Xbox 360. Oh, it's, it's, it's okay. really not that old. Xbox oh, really? 360. It actually has good graphics. Wow. I remember when it came out. I just it was under so many other things that yeah, I didn't it, make it up. Yeah, it got buried. It yeah. really did get buried. I've but seen it, it in bargain bins. Yeah, no. If you if you like narrative and games, and you like you can you can handle the gameplay of a Japanese RPG. And you're not like anti because some people just don't like that style. Mm-hmm. It's worth playing. You you probably enjoy it. I built my publishing career on it. So yeah. yeah. <laughs> I recommend it, and even though Richard is not here, I will recommend it in his stead, because yeah. I know he really does enjoy the game. He's, we've talked about it many times. Well, there we go. <laughs> so there we go. Chris, do you have anything that comes to mind? Uh, 
I'm not sure. I've got, I mean, I'm sure if I like really thought hard about it, I could probably search my databanks and find games that have themes of redemption in them, but none that really stand out to me. Um, for me, like the, the quintessential Christmas story, if you will, even if it's not an explicitly Christmassy movie, um, well, I just sort of tipped my hand there. They tend to be movies mm-hmm. or books or something along those lines where you kind of got this sort of story usually told pretty quickly um, about kind of like this person who goes through this thing and comes out on the other side somehow better. Um, whereas with games, like you were saying, Doc, um, you sort of start good and get better. Yeah, yeah. Um, you don't really, not too many games have much of an element of you kind of going from good to bad to back to good. Um, and not in like a really meaningful character way. I mean, there's mm-hmm. been, you know, Metroid, for instance, is infamous for the, you start off with moderately good gear, lose all of it, and have to build yourself back up toward the end. Mm-hmm. Um, the one, I guess, that might come to mind, sorry, I see you want to say something. Just go ahead. Um, but uh, Metal Gear Solid 3 kind of has an element of Snake gets defeated. Oh. That's a, to, that's a really good one, actually. Has to come back and redeem himself through this other mission. I would say the one who redeems themselves in, the, in, in that one is Big Boss. Mm-hmm. Uh, I'm sorry, not Big Boss. The Boss. The Boss. Big Boss yeah. is the... Spoiler, dude. It's an old game. <laughs> Spoilers! It's an old game. I have totally played it. <laughs> it's, so. it that's, a, that's a really great one, though. I think the character of the Boss in that one, mm-hmm. um, she sort of embodies those sort of characters. Well, too. actually, I think her story is more one, uh, less of redemption, but more of... Um, just sort of like really selfless yeah. sort of sacrifice. Well, she's treated as a traitor. Like everyone kind of mm. assumes. That but she all is. along, though, you kind That's of figure true. out she that is, she was. She is kind of. She did kind of plan it from the start. Yeah. That is a good point. She did kind of plan it. Mm-hmm. But she is trying to redeem a choice that they made. That's, That's a good yeah, point. She realized yeah, it was true. a mistake. Yeah, true. So cool. Um, you were saying about the you don't often get characters. Mm-hmm. Uh, I'm going to cheat a little bit and say in Tales of Vesperia, mm. your protagonist is a kind of a there are two people who are friends growing up and join the garden one of them leaves mm-hmm. that's who you play as you start the game mm-hmm. he's off on his own mission one of the first few things he does is murder some people ah. this is the character you play he is the protagonist of the game and he is fantastic mm-hmm. now it's it's legitimate it's like the the justified murdering mm-hmm. because this guy's really really bad but he doesn't just do this once mm. And there's an entire side plot that emphasizes this. And the whole, uh, the whole part of the point of the game is he's doing these things for a reason, while his friend is doing the exact opposite for the same reason. Hmm. And so you are playing the dark side of this. You, you go pretty far down and then climb your way back up. Interesting. Um, Actually, it's well uh, worth playing. Now that you mentioned Tales, it reminds me of uh, Tales of Symphonia. Which is mm-hmm. was yeah. going to be yeah. my redemption. Early on, you get yeah. exiled from your town for reasons it's not really your fault, and then eventually you're able to return a hero and that sort of stuff, but that's actually like fairly early in the game yep. compared mm-hmm. to the full length. Uh, yeah, interesting stuff. They do something almost like an inversion of that concept in the original Fallout game, where... Um, you're sort of sent out as, you know, to get the the water chip, and mm-hmm. you're supposed to be the hero of the town that's going to like save save the vault, rather hero of the vault, um, with the water chip. And then when you come back, you're sort of treated as this like pariah because you've been tainted by the world. Mm-hmm. So it's almost like an inversion of like you've sort of been corrupted by, uh, by like you know society and, mm-hmm. and the wasteland and all that kind of stuff. It's almost a, the the opposite because you are treated as the savior initially. Mm-hmm. My jump would actually, you mentioned Tales of Symphonia, that would be my jump, um, mostly because the entire game is centered around themes of family and redemption. Mm-hmm. From the very beginning, what you're hearing about is this story of two people who selflessly are of um, a person waiting for the redemption of the world, um, and you set out on a journey with a friend of yours who's official father shows up to send her on a quest to redeem the world. Mm-hmm. So from the get-go, your whole point is this restoration, and there are themes of who is my real father, is it my birth father, is it the angelic being that claims to be my father. Mm-hmm. Um, and then as you progress, you find out that you are not really trying to redeem uh, the protagonist, mm-hmm. so much as all of his companions have problems. Mm-hmm. They're actually... This game is old, is it cool if I... It's- you're talking about Symphonia, right? Yes. Yeah, yeah, I played through it. Yeah, spoil the way. Okay. It's good. <laughs> um, a couple of the characters actually betray you in the game. These mm-hmm. are characters you played with through the whole game. You are given the choice 
of how you redeem the characters. It's very limited, mm -hmm. but um, did you did any of you guys play it multiple times? If I, I remember it once. If I remember right, I don't think you have to either. No, right? You're so given the choice, right? Mm -hmm. What you end up with is that one specific character betrays you off the get go, and it's family like family related, and so it's yeah. how do you justify his actions? How do you redeem his actions? And it's him redeeming the actions for his family, redeeming the actions of his friends, and trying to make things work. But additionally, there's another character who betrays you, and you are given the choice of helping him to find the road to redemption, showing him levels of trust so that he redeems himself. Mm. And depending on how you do that, he either survives or dies. Mm. One of the two. Interesting. Um, you can actually lose that character permanently. Mm -hmm. uh, Mechanically, you still have that character, but doesn't really. Mm -hmm. But you get that that option. Of Are you talking you about? Um, I'm drawing a blank. Something with the K. So Kratos mm -hmm. betrays you early on in the game. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and that's like Lloyd's true father. Yes. Yeah. And you spend most of the game trying to figure out why, mm -hmm. and you discover it's a, it's a redemption thing, mm -hmm. and then it's. He starts doing that because Lloyd is trying to redeem even villains. Mm -hmm. Because as they progress, they find that there's two sides to everybody. Mm -hmm. yeah. But additionally, the guy who replaces Kratos mechanically, uh, Zelos, yeah. Yeah. betrays you to the bad guys. Depending on how you treated him before that happens, and depending on how you treat him going further, mm -hmm. there is a point where he will sacrifice himself to save you while he's part of the villains. Huh. Or if you re reject him completely, mm -hmm. He sacrifices himself and he kills him. Mm. So he still does the same thing either way because he, he trusts you, but if you trusted him and were willing to redeem his actions, uh -huh. he survives. Mm. Huh, very neat. Um, reminds me a little bit actually of um, Dragon Age Origins um, with that one assassin character who um, can betray you midway through the game yeah. depending on how your relationship was and how you react. Um, you may or may not be able to get away with not having to kill him. Like, you'll actually just yeah. rejoin your party. There's there's this moment, I was thinking, speaking of characters that betray you, which is <laughs> very Christmas-related, actually. But um, <laughs> along those same lines, Baldur's Gate, another early Bioware game, but Baldur's Gate 2. Um, I think you've played Baldur's Gate 2, right? Oh, yeah. yeah. Uh, Yoshimo should be a name that you remember then. Yoshimo, the, mm -hmm. um, the samurai thief. Which, uh, the interesting thing was, when you first get the character, you, especially unless you're playing a thief character, you're kind of excited because you don't have a thief that's worth a damn in the game. So you're thinking, wow, this, this is great, I'm going to use this guy all the time. And he actually is kind of funny, so you keep him around. And he straight up is, he betrays you near the end. You get to the end game part, part and he's completely um, on the side of um, Irenicus, the bad guy. Right, Irenicus? John Irenicus? Yeah. yeah. Um, he's com he's completely been working for him the entire time. That's interesting. So you I have never this character. Got to that. Yeah, with, I never did experienced you get all the way to the end of the game. Or no, you just didn't use I just didn't have him. Oh, it's 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 actually great because you have this character that basically, I mean, there's really not a whole lot of foreshadowing for. He just he seems like I mean, of course, he always seems kind of shady, but he's a thief. So you're just sort of mm -hmm. thinking, oh, I mean, if he's a thief, of course he's shady. No, he he's been working for the villain the entire time. He betrays you, and you do not have a choice. You have to kill him. Wow. There is no, like, I'm going to redeem him. I'm going to save him. He doesn't want to do it, by the way. He's been um, something like he's been ensorcelled or something. Like, he's been uh, sort of like he has some sort of spell on him where he has no choice but to serve Irenicus or he will die kind of thing. So You can't disenchant that? No, he's completely, he will attack you and wow. try to kill you, and he even says it, and you have to kill him to stop him. So it's this kind of interesting moment where, which I thought it was fantastic. Yeah, that's because great. It, you, a lot of these games they sort of cop out and they make it. Yeah. So especially, I would imagine, for example, if this took place in a newer Bioware game, <laughs> you'd be able to save him. They would have some sort of a quest or some sort of thing, and you could save him, and everyone would find out about it because there's the internet, and you, yeah. everyone would know within like a day or two of release how to do it, mm -hmm. and it would kind of ruin that moment. Actually, but, you could fall in love with him and then have Oh, probably, yeah. Just, <laughs> there'd be a romance option with Yoshino, yeah. too. Actually, that, that was an option I'm with sure the Assassin Dragon Age. <laughs> yeah, there you go. So. I'm sure there was, but... Uh, but this kind of, I, I just really loved that touch where you don't have a choice. He, in a way, he sort of, in a sense, you could argue, redeems himself. Because if I remember correctly, in a, he he kind of outs himself before he has to. And then there's this moment of he wants you to defeat him even though he has to fight against you kind of thing. So there's this almost like, it's fatalistic, but it's also kind of sad because you don't really hate him. You just feel like you kind of have to beat him. You have to fight him and kill him. 
So there is that element to it, but still, it's it's a very interesting twist. The players that betray you. It's kind of bringing up some vibes, and it's recent enough that I won't spoil it, but um, Walking Dead Season 2, the, mm-hmm. the video game. I, um, I still haven't played it. I haven't played it. <laughs> uh, incidentally, it does you have... own it, but haven't uh, played it. Right? I own it and haven't played Me it. Me too. Yeah. It, uh, too. it has lots of snow in it, so that kind of gives you like, automatically that sort of wintry oh. feel. Oh, okay. um, but also... Um, and zombies. Yes, and zombies. Christmas zombies. Yeah. yeah. Just consumerist zombies. That's Dang. what we all are. Ah. So. <laughs> Wait, this is Dead Rising? <laughs> yes. Uh, <laughs> Instead of brains, it's like Walmart. <laughs> yeah. Actually, yeah, no, if we uh, just wanted to say if uh, if Christmas games are about the mall, then... Dead Rising. Dead Rising. Yeah. Zombies and mall. Hey, that's not, that's not a bad connection to make. Oh, Jesus rose from the dead. Yeah. yeah. So there is a connection. <laughs> Technically, though, he was not actually a zombie. He still had a brain. He was a lich. Right. And that would also be more Easter themed too. Right, that's yeah. that's a good point. So that's for another show. <laughs> right. Uh, but yeah, that's that's a that's a, a pretty good So kind of a question good. question I would pose for you guys then is um, if you could have like your ideal Christmas game. Like a game that was specifically made to be Christmassy but not just based on like a really bad, you know, movie license. Uh, oh you mean alone. like Batman Returns or <laughs> yeah. uh, Home Alone? Yeah. Are, uh, <laughs> like what what sort of Christmas game would you guys want? I actually completely forgot that Batman Returns was Christmas themed until you mentioned it. Now yeah. that I think about it, yeah, it really totally was. I actually feel like I should watch it again. The Sega game, right? <laughs> I was thinking of the movie. I haven't seen it in a long oh, time. Oh yeah, well there was there were title games. But a lot yeah. of these, a lot of these Christmas movies had title. I mean, uh, uh, we we're talking about Die Hard. Die Hard yeah, mm-hmm. Chris and I were talking about yeah. how the Die Hard, Die Hard had an arcade game, and then of course it had console versions. Sure too. did. It had a really famous arcade game. Yeah, that Die was Hard. All, over the, all the Die Hards were Christmas movies, weren't they? Just the first two. But the first one is the one that most people think of okay. when they think of the Christmas. But yeah, the second one technically was Christmas themed too. The third one wasn't. And it's then, been too long. And there's been no others after the third one. That was the last one. That well, the third happened. one was recent. No, the right? third one was in 1992. There's been no other Die Hard movies that have ever existed. Oh, I see what you're saying. Yeah. I, it's I, it's I, like Star Wars. <laughs> there's been three Star Wars movies. I hear there's a new one coming out. But Okay, yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. And, and uh, Indiana Jones? Those th- Just three. Those three Indiana Jones movies? <laughs> yeah. I, I, now, now, do you acknowledge the existence of the young Indiana Jones Chronicles? Or yeah, actually, some of those were pretty good. They were fantastic. To be honest, yeah. I, in fact, I, I went through the. They're on Netflix right now, so. But they cut some stuff out. They did, and it really annoyed me. But Netflix didn't do it. It wasn't yeah, their fault. It, it was the DVD release yeah. that did it. So, um, it's not really Netflix's fault. But yeah, all the Harrison Ford stuffs cut out. Yeah. Of it, which is he's it's an old very makeup disappointed stuff, though. So. You know, that's what, something that I think. Speaking of Young Indiana Jones, and I honestly can't remember if they do that in Young Indiana Jones, but a lot of TV shows will do, they'll have like the, the typical, the, the traditional Christmas episode, you know? Mm. They'll do like, you know, this around Christmas time, they'll say, oh, this is the Christmas episode, and everyone will kind of some way relate to something related to Christmas, regardless of whether it's, um... <laughs> Sorry, bad yeah, Christmas episode. That's fine. <laughs> no, a lot of them are bad. A lot of them are bad. But the point is, the point is that there really isn't, there, there doesn't seem to be that with... Um, with games, our version of the Christmas episode is always the, um, you download, like, a special DLC and yeah. now you can, like, wear, like, for example, um, Grand Theft Auto is having a Christmas DLC coming out pretty soon, Grand Theft Auto V. From what I understand, it's really just going to be a variety of, like, you know, you can get new hats and you can mm-hmm. buy new clothes that are Christmas themed mm-hmm. and there will be some places that might have snow or something. Yeah. Even, you know, uh, even Crusader Kings 2 has a DLC yeah. where you get a uh, Christmas song that adds to the soundtrack. So, right, so it, it yeah. kind of, it comes across as an afterthought. Yeah. Right? It's not really, it doesn't really feel as though it's sort of changing the game or it's mm-hmm. kind of trying to embrace Christmas-related themes. Mm-hmm. Nights into dreams. I'm just. I'm not going to explain it again. But nights into dreams. That's. I think that's a pretty good. A pretty good one because it does feel like that. That it changes enough of the experience that it does feel different. And at least from the way you describe it, I haven't played it. Yet. Back. I played nights, but not the Christmas. Back before DLC was like a huge thing. They had expansion packs, but on the original Dreamcast, mm-hmm. um, in the original Sonic Adventure on December 25th, mm-hmm. they actually had a Christmas tree that would show up in the main lot in the starting area. Just did I know that in um, Batman Arkham City, uh, Calendar Man? Uh, if, I don't know if you all played Batman Arkham City. I don't think I got that far. There's uh, well, there's a villain that is in that is sort of like trapped and in, in, inside one of these you know prisons or whatever uh, named Calendar Man. And if you talk to Calendar Man on different different dates, like real world dates, like your your system is on that date. Right. He tell he tells you different things. Like he'll react to the date because he's obsessed with, with dates and, mm-hmm. and holidays and all that kind of stuff. Calendar man. <laughs> so um, 
I assume he says something related to Christmas. You know, it's like Probably. I'm not I'm not one of those people that is so obsessed with that that I fast forwarded my yeah. clock. <laughs> but people have done it. You can actually go on YouTube and you can see all you know all of his all the different things that he says based mm-hmm. on the different holidays. So I'm sure he says something Christmas related. Mm-hmm. Um, Again, I believe that Jazz Jackrabbit technically had a Christmas level, mm-hmm. just flat out lights on trees and snow everywhere. I really want to say that Diablo did, but maybe I guess not. I, 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 I feel like there was a Diablo level that had some sort of a Christmas thing. I, I want to say, too, that um, Borderlands or Borderlands 2 probably had a Christmas thing at some point. Um, I know they did like a Thanksgiving one. I know they did at least one Halloween-themed one. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm hmm. not sure about Christmas, or just winter in general. What was the name of the World of Warcraft holiday festival? Well, I mean, we're sort of jumping around really Win- fast Winter? Here. Was it Winterfest? But, yeah, what was it? Was it Winterfest? Winter Winter Fest? Okay. So Star right. Trek Online has Q's Winter Wonderland. Hmm. And, uh, yeah, it's... It's kind of funny because you can win, I think it's Breen, um, based starships in it, um, which they're the super cold, like they have to wear enviro suits everywhere they go because they have to live near 50 Kelvin or something like yeah, that. Yeah, I, I remember know. the Breen, yeah. Yeah. So, and there's like snowball fights, and I think this year what they had them doing is you fight, uh, Borg snowmen. Borg snowmen. They are animated snowmen with Borg parts. <laughs> nice. And you fight the collective Borg this collective snowman. It's kind of a Calvin and Hobbes thing, almost. Nice. So, I love the Calvin and Hobbes uh, like snowman art thing. Yes, yeah, that was oh, yes. awesome. Uh, well, that would be a great game. Yeah. Mm. Oh Actually, my goodness, Calvin and Hobbes, the video game with a with an all snow Christmas themed level mm. section. Did Did you all ever play the Final Fantasy Tactics Advance, the mm. first one? Yeah. Yeah. Um, they have. Oh, yeah, that was around scene, Christmas time. Yeah, yeah. It, the whole first part of it before they go into the fantasy world for the world changes, whichever. Um, they have this whole scene where you basically they, they're sort of a tutorial level, mm. and you have to fight using like throwing snowballs. It's at great. Different kids. I love it. It's like one it's, of the best tutorials. It was pretty cool. And yeah. then of course you get to the fantasy world, and the game sort of breaks down narratively because you as a main character have to break the heart of every single friend <laughs> that you have to get back to the normal world. Like, essentially, they put it this way. All of your friends have problems in the real world. Like, for example, one of your friends is in a wheelchair, can't walk, and all this. And in the fantasy world, they can walk, and they're completely healed, and they're, like, perfect. Mm -hmm. And then, like, another friend is, like, really, he doesn't have any friends, and he kind of feels, like, left out and a loner. But in the fantasy world, he's got, like, all these friends, and he's, like, this, like, you know, all... So, essentially, every kid, all of their flaws are now fixed in the fantasy world. Mm -hmm. And and you are the only... And, like, every other person that you run into also loves this world. And then you're there, and you're like, I want to go. I want things to go back to the way they are. And your whole mission is to basically change things back to the way they are. And it would be really cool if Square had recognized how much of a jerk this makes you, and focused <laughs> on it, and gone, "You're doing this because you're a selfish jerk." But it never recognizes it. It presents well, because, you as like the normal, yeah, they, the normal they, hero. They took the stance of it was a commentary on escapism. But and it, so you were the one character to acknowledge that none of this is real and you need to accept reality. But, they, sort of but the thing is, it was reality. That's the problem. The problem <laughs> was that it wasn't a fantasy. They were literally in this world. Mm-hmm. There was no... It wasn't like they were... But they got sucked in through a book. Right, but it was Which, actually happening. Like, it wasn't like they were going to die it, if they... As far as they were concerned, yeah. So you're saying Riven right. isn't real? Is that <laughs> right? I might be saying that. Wow. <laughs> that sounds like uh, Psychonauts only... Like twisted, yeah. Which is saying something because yeah. Psychonauts was pretty <laughs> twisted. Mm-hmm. But at least in Psychonauts, there's that redemptive theme again. I think yeah, you're actually, going yeah. into people's minds and you're fixing them. Mm-hmm. You know the problem? They're fixing their problems. Mm-hmm. Everybody has emotional baggage, things like that. But I, mm-hmm. I, yeah. I loved, I loved that game. Yeah. It was great. Yeah, you almost kind of are this kind of um, this figure that is helping all of these people sort of work through their their problems mm-hmm. and kind of come to terms with them. Yeah, that's a good example, I think. Mm-hmm. In the same way, same guy, the cave. I did not think the about that until just now. Have either of you played the cave? I played it. Yeah, I don't think so. It is fantastic. You basically, it's a large puzzle game mm-hmm. that, depending on which three characters you pick, you do different things or you go different ways through this cave. Mm-hmm. Each one has the goal of gaining a special item. Mm-hmm. However, it's at the cost of something massive. Mm-hmm. Okay. Um, so it gets pretty dark. Um, I can't finish this. This. I can't relate it without spoiling a, a, a thing. I think it. spoilers are okay. So, you get to the end, and you had to go past this place that explained it to you. To leave again, he's there, and you have the choice of keeping the item uh-huh. or giving it back and climbing out the ladder. A lot of people of don't game. know that, though. They'll play the I game. Didn't. Yeah. I played the whole game and kept the items and climbed out. Mm. 
And uh, one of my favorite characters is the um, the adventurous. Yes. Uh, her and her and the time traveler are great because the adventurous. She does not like her coworkers, <laughs> and she kills both of them to get her item. Huh. Yep. So when you climb out of the cave, it shows you that that is her story. But if instead you give the item back, they are saved, mm. huh. and she repents cool. of her ways. Mm -hmm. Every single character is like that. Yeah, interesting. It's, it's fantastic. Yeah, hmm. in, in fact, the, the the little kids I think are the creepiest. Oh yeah, because totally. they're they're basically ghosts when you start, so you know something weird has gone on. Um, but what you discover over the course of it is that they wanted out of their house, and so they did a terrible, terrible thing. Dark and terrible. <laughs> they mentioned terrible. Yep. Yes. <laughs> yes. To, to actually answer your question mm. of what the perfect Christmas game would be for me, I will relate it to yet another Tim Schafer game <laughs> um, and say uh, Costume Quest. Ah. The Halloween game uh -huh. was with the little kids, one of the siblings, depending on which one you choose to play, the other one gets kidnapped, and you go around town trick-or-treating and also changing into costumes. As you change into costumes, you gain all these really cool special powers of the imagination, mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, and they just came out with Costume Quest 2, which mm -hmm. was fantastic as well. Um, that kind of a game, little adventure questy kind of game with with boss fights and battles and stuff, I think would translate well into a, any holiday theme. But I think as a Christmas theme, it would be fantastic as well. Um, so I I would encourage them to do exactly that. Mm -hmm. Costume Quest Three could be a Christmas thing. Oh, interesting. Yeah, I know. I played through. I played through Bully for the first time mm. about. A month Good ago. example. Yeah, and they have, which by the way, I really enjoyed it. I'm kind of kicking myself that I missed it the first time through. Um, but uh, they go through. They have different holiday moments that you that you encounter in Bullworth Academy, and one of them yeah, is Christmas. Yeah, sure it is. And um, it's kind of cool because even though, first of all, even though the game is called Bully, you're actually not a bully. No, you're not. You're the exact opposite. In fact, you kind of fight bullies and try to create this sort of like you bring all the clicks almost, together. Yeah, almost yeah. perfect school. You, you it's kind of bully interesting. The bullies, you, kind of. you actually do completely. Yeah. Um, but uh, but anyway, there you have this. The first day, you know, the first time that it starts to become Christmas, you're immediately called into the principal, and the first thing that happens is that your your mother gives you this Christmas sweater. So you have this yeah. ridiculous like reindeer sweater that, of course, you have to put on immediately. <laughs> so you're walking around the school, and everyone is giving you shit, like just making fun of you. <laughs> of course, obviously, it's it's hilarious, but that's part of Christmas too. You know, your family gives you some sort mm -hmm. of. Uh, uh, Maybe embarrassing, you know, clothing or embarrassing gift or something, something sort of embarrassing thing related to your family. You kind of have to put up with it. You know, it's just kind of part of the season. And yeah, they have this whole thing where, um, you know, the whole place is of course decorated. They have the little, uh, the the town is all decorated up, and you've got the snow everywhere. And it, um, I want to say there were there was some sort of a special quest that you had to do related to Chris. Oh, the, you had the drunk. Santa in town. That's oh, yeah. what it was. And it actually was really dark because he wanted to, like, people didn't give him any sort of attention because he's, of course, a crazy drunk hobo mm -hmm. wearing a Santa suit that is, like, really dirty. But all the guy wanted to do was he wanted to basically set up him, have, him have like, a little, like, you know, come, kids come see Santa and take pictures with Santa. Mm. You know, nothing, nothing, like, you know, untoward about it. He just actually wanted to be. Santa for once on Christmas. It's like actually kind of touching, mm. and you're you kind of have to help him be Santa and prevent people from messing up his you know Santa endeavors or whatever. So uh, yeah, you have to like you have to take pictures of him having like little kids come and like sit on his knee. He has you. Like, <laughs> he has you literally. He has your task is you have to take pictures and save pictures for him and give him the pictures afterward. Um, of course, then later on you have another quest where you completely ruin. The Christmas display in the middle of the town and beat up a bunch of elves and <laughs> so you kind you kind of go both ways, but uh, I did kind of think that was pretty cool that they kind of throw in these these weird sort of outcast characters and you kind of stick up for them, which I think is so. I noticed especially in movies they do this a lot in, in terms of redemptive themes where they have these, especially Santa related. It's always like some bum or some mm -hmm. you know transient someone that's like or maybe someone that's sort of like kind of a loser sort of out of it and they kind of you know through the Christmas spirit they kind of become redeemed and and they sort of learn something about themselves and they're able to you know for one day of the year mm -hmm. they can kind of 
you know, I'm, be... I'm reminded of um, a Decemberween mackerel. Yeah. That was the Homestar Hunter cartoon. Oh, yeah? Where, uh, um, oh, who was it that was going to die? Was it the Homestar or the Poop Smith? I forget which. Or I, missed, I missed this episode okay. entirely. Um, it, was, it was like one I of their on more... Dialogue, dude. I couldn't watch any of that. <laughs> yeah. Well, this is actually <laughs> one of their more recent ones before they kind of went into um, hibernation, so to speak, mm-hmm. um, as a website. Um, they had this one Christmas episode. Uh, I forget exactly what happens, but essentially a character is like out in the cold and they're going to die, and it's very it's very much a parody. They're making fun of all these Christmas films and mm-hmm. stuff, so um, Marzipan is wanting to um, like do all this stuff to like, you know, enliven him with the Christmas spirit and, you know, make everything better. Um, and I think like he just like ends up dying at the end or something, and like, they, they like bring him back somehow. I, I forget exactly what happens, but it was humorous. I probably just gave a really bad summary of that cartoon, but <laughs> that was fantastic. Yeah, but, but go see it; it's awesome. December Ween mackerel. It's, it's supposed to be sounding like a miracle. I've so. not seen it. There is a Homestar Runner game, isn't there? There is. Um, Strong Bad's cool game for attractive people. But it's not. There's no Christmas. You're not talking about the Burninator. Mm-hmm. Oh, okay. <laughs> Uh, on your original thing, I'm going to jump to mechanics real quick okay. for describing the perfect Chris, like what best illustrates Christmas. Mm. And I'm going to hate myself for saying this, but every quotes I'm doing air quotes because it's very <laughs> emphasized good um, <laughs> social platform casual game. Mm. What other game has Christmas themed appearance, excessive gift giving? social awkwardness, <laughs> tons of family and friends, mm-hmm. and a lot of commercialism all in one game. Aside from games like Mouse Hunt and Farm Qu- or Farmville mm. and all of those Words games. with friends. <laughs> that doesn't have quite as many. It has a winter skin on right now. It does. I did not download that. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not a fan of the holidays, so yeah, I, I skip most of that stuff, but... Really, if you think about it, there's very little difference in the mechanics of general Christmas versus the mechanics of a, of a social platform game. Hmm. Um, there should be like White Elephant the video game. Hmm. <laughs> now that's a great idea. <laughs> you can have like a, a binary morality meter between naughty and nice. Yes. Ooh, this is good. <laughs> yeah, I think one of the things, and I actually think that's a pretty good point in terms of the mechanic, the mechanic based. I know um, one idea that, that Chris brought up at the um, we were out at the the Fillmore Pub earlier today, uh-huh. and uh, Chris Chris brought up this concept of sort of like a um, North Pole Tycoon game. Yeah. If you want to run through, yeah, how it would so work, it was a pretty cool concept. The the idea is basically that like I I wrote a short story a while back where I sort of had this world building thing and. You know, there have been a bunch of stuff before that has um, had their own take on Santa Claus. And so mine was that Santa Claus was essentially Big Brother. He sees you when you're sleeping. He knows when you're awake. Um, <laughs> he's very... Uh, he's very, a stalker. Yes, he's involved behind the scenes with a lot of stuff that happens internationally and sort of like runs politics and the economies. Um, but sort of a not-so-creepy, <laughs> menacing spin-off he's of that a, idea. He's a creepy old man. That's <laughs> yes. why they call and it Black Friday. Friday. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Because yeah. Black Friday, to me, always had like kind of bloody Sunday ring to it. Yeah, it really so, does. But, uh, um, but what my idea was is that uh, not quite so dark, but you would basically be Santa Claus, but you're essentially the CEO, so to speak, of the North Pole. And so you have to manage um, toy production throughout the year. You have to manage logistics on Christmas Day to make sure everything gets out. And Sim what Santa. Yeah, Sim yeah. Santa, essentially. And you have to um, determine the, the statistics. You were talking about this. Yeah, that, yeah. We, like, uh, the statistics for naughty and nice list. Yeah, like, like, how are you going to balance? Like, how strict are you going to be? Who gets on the naughty Just create on the curve. Because if well, you don't get enough, enough kids who are, who are good, mm-hmm. who are trying to be good, the world, like, falls into well, yes. But also, you don't have um, a, you, yeah, you may not have enough. Yeah, toys. if, if like production, production, is, may production be low. is down this year, so we need to be a little bit stricter because yeah. we can't meet the quota. You can't there are too meet many nice kids. the quota. But if you don't have, <laughs> but if you don't give out enough kid, give, give out enough toys, there's not enough. You don't Christmas have enough cheer. nice kids the next year. Yeah, yeah, you lose yeah. out on Christmas oh, cheer. Man. Man. Yeah. Oh, so man. so yeah, there's like long term repercussions to your yeah. actions. Yeah. So you can you can tax them higher, mm. but then you have less people in your city. Is it? Do you have Christmas cheer or Christmas jeer? I would download and play this game. <laughs> That's what I was saying. I yeah, think it sounds absolutely. pretty cool. Mm-hmm. So, Maybe we should make it. It's Kickstarter. That's not. <laughs> <laughs> Let's not do that. No, the K word is not allowed around my table. I'm sorry. Oh. Those. I Indiegogo? mean, those. Indiegogo is another. Yeah. Kotaku. Oh. Indiegogo. At least uh, you uh, can get partial funding. So. The. Um, I know uh, the Tycoon games used to be somewhat popular. I, think. Mm-hmm. I don't know how popular they are now. Well, though. the market's I, changed so much. I've always wondered too if all the Tycoon games, because like there are a bunch of games with the Tycoon Tycoon added at the yeah. end. 
But I was never sure if they were all the same developer, just people it, doing the same type of game. No, no, it was it was a whole studio. Was no, Railroad okay. Tycoon and Zoo Tycoon the same studio? Yes, then? and so it was like Transport um, Tycoon, Roller Coaster Tycoon. Which all one did you say? Transport Roll- Tycoon. Trans- it was War in- Transport. I, I don't think I played that one, so I don't know. It's an entirely different. I assume it's the same, but I'm not sure. Even in visual, it's entirely different from the others. Well, they made them over a long period of time, so the visuals changed over time. Yeah. So they were prob- it was probably the same studio, because they pr- actually, in all honesty, if you made this game and you tried to call it North Pole Tycoon, you would probably be sued, no, because yeah, they probably yeah. have a trademark. We, we wouldn't call it Tycoon. North Pole Tycoon, it's just it's, kind of a way to summarize. Because I didn't think it was the same company that did Railroad Tycoon and Transport Tycoon. I thought they were two different groups. I could be wrong. I, I think they're the same, but I can't check. Well, that, that one's gone multiplayer and kind of mm. free to play now. Oh, really? So it's a whole different story. It's a little bit strange, but... Mm. The original was technically Server-based. free to play, but you were limited to two trains because you didn't actually have a have the uh, the chart to tell what train you had, and so you'd obviously pirated the game, so... Oh, oh no. My brother has them memorized. He doesn't need the chart. That's funny. <laughs> but it's a strange property in the first place because there was a board game called... Um, you know, Railroad Tycoon, and they lost the license to call it that. So the exact same game has now been reprinted as Trains Across the World, mm-hmm. huh. something like that. Rails Across the World, I think that's it. Hmm. Um, but it's the exact same game. All the expansions work with it. So. You could you could do a crossover mm-hmm. with um, Santa Tycoon and Polar Express. No, I was just thinking that actually. Yeah. Oh, there you go. Yeah, I'm just. Or I actually wasn't thinking the crossover, but the Polar Express. You have to deliver yeah. the toys. Mm-hmm. So we haven't mentioned Elf Bowling yet. Oh, a, a classic Christmas game. Elf Bowling, yeah. It yeah. Does, I wouldn't. I don't know. Which if was made classic, into a movie. <laughs> what? Really? Yes, <laughs> it's on Netflix as well. CG. Wow. It's oh, really, man. really bad. <laughs> really? Don't say. No, it, it sounds like it's it would be bad. Great. Let's just say I'd rather rewatch Cat in the Hat knows Christmas than to actually <laughs> watch that one again. It's. I found. I found one. The Transport Tycoon. Yeah, that's it. I was talking. It is Microprose, which was the same one they right. did all the other ones. Microprose. So yeah. yeah. They also did yeah colonization. And, yeah. They did a ton. Yeah, they did a ton. Yeah. Ton of those. Yeah, the Tycoon game. I, mean, I think North Pole Tycoon could work, <laughs> or Santa Tycoon. We have to call something up something else. Yeah. Well, you'd have to drop the Tycoon. Part Sim Santa, that. and then also North Pole Tycoon. Sim Santa might. If you call it Sim Santa, you'll be sued as well. <laughs> and then they, you know, they they compete. Santaville <laughs> would get you get you sued. Santaville? Would Santaville? No, I don't think so. Um. So Zynga is very very particular about the Ville title. Um. Anything that used it got in trouble. It's kind of funny because I believe that's actually part of the reason that GameLoft had to name their. Uh, a lot of their entities different things. For instance, their... Oh, this is going to get me in trouble. Their MLP game is called MLP The Game. Because even though the main town is Ponyville, which would have fit perfectly, they would have gotten sued for it. Now, when you say MLP, you mean... Yes. Go ahead. My Little Pony. Okay. <laughs> so, um, Major League Baseball. But I'm pretty sure... I haven't <laughs> delved into it, but I'm pretty sure that's the reason. Because I know that Zynga actually sued another company mm. over using Ville in their title, even though they didn't have anything in that thing. That's true. Yeah. So. Uh, what, what the trick is, is to make a game that Zynga wants to steal, mm-hmm. and then copies, and then what you do is um, you sue them, and then they give you a buy-off. Mm. Um, that's the real way to make money um, off Zynga. <laughs> I was so. going to make a game that was going to be Cruella In the Christmas Deville, spirit. Right, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> My game was going to be Cruella Deville, and you would like sell puppies, but I was going to get sued for most of the time. <laughs> it's like to say Disney will come after you. Actually, yeah, I, would, so. I would actually love like a, a joke game, Cruella Deville's Puppy Hunt. Yeah. <laughs> Go around like, just Mixed slaughtering puppies. Deville, you're going after puppies. <laughs> yeah, yes. You have to get better and better henchmen. Yeah. Yeah, didn't didn't that, that film take place during Christmas as well? Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah I, I guess it, was. it did. Yeah, pretty sure. At least wintry times. Yeah. Wintry times. <laughs> yeah, there's another. Harry Potter. Need a, a nod there. Yeah, there's um, there's a Christmas. There's some Christmas. There's at least a Christmas oh, chapter in just about every yeah. game slash movie. Lion the Witch and Wardrobe. It takes place. Mm-hmm. Oh yeah. It's always winter, never oh, Christmas. Yeah. The land of Christmas. Yeah. Yeah. Father Christmas shows up. Mm-hmm. Yeah, he does. Well, that's the thing. It's never Christmas. It's never Christmas. And then one day. That's right. So that's exactly right. Hmm. But that was that was the curse of uh, yeah. of the witch and you know, all that. So big who, metaphor actually. Is uh, C.S. Lewis was writing uh, Christian allegory. Yeah, mm-hmm. so. and that's why I'd seen like pretty much every film adaptation of the Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe ever created sometime in my school the- career. Oh, really? Yeah, because <laughs> I, I, I went to a Catholic school. I read a lot. Of, I mean, I read the books. I really enjoyed them <laughs> well, as a kid. I mean, I know the um, 
that one they used to air on, I want to say it was Disney Channel. might have been Nickelodeon. The cartoon mm-hmm. they used to air on Disney Channel. Mm-hmm. I saw it like a million times. Um, did y'all, you know, kind of the one I'm talking about with... It was just the first, the first book. If I saw it, I'd probably yeah. recognize it. I've only seen the BBC and uh, the BBC live action. I'm pre- and oh, I think movies, this so. one seems like it was made by BBC too. It was like an like a British. It seemed British. They all had British accents, so I assume it was British. Well, they were all British characters, so right. Yeah. Well, but it could have been made in you know. <laughs> yeah. Uh, the 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 live action American ones are sort mm-hmm. of kind of hit or miss. Really, I mean, I think what I, what I kind of like is that they they do a different. They'll bring in like a different uh, composer for the music each time. Oh, that's interesting. And hmm. some of the soundtracks are really good. I think it was Dawn of the Dawn of the um... Dawn Trader. Thank you. Yes. Oh, Dawn Voyage Tra- of the Dawn Trader. Voyage of the Dawn Trader. Yeah, yeah. I've got that. the the soundtrack of that one is really really good. I do remember um, enjoying that. Actually. Yeah, it's. I mean, the movie yeah, it was okay, See, that's but the thing. soundtrack was fantastic. I like I like the soundtracks in all of them. Yeah. But out of the movies, the Voyage of the Dawn Trader, despite being completely different from the book. Mm-hmm. It's kind of, in my opinion, the best out of the three. I Um, I haven't seen that one, actually. The first movie... It's self-contained. ...tries to follow the book without being the actual book. It it falls into that trap of, we're going to use all the elements from the book and not adapt them for the screen properly. Mm -hmm. Whereas the second movie is, we're going to adapt this for the screen and we're going to gut all the characters. (laughs) Every character in that movie is completely gutted and especially Peter becomes horrible. Horrible characters. So that's what we call overcorrection. <laughs> Whereas the third movie, you cannot make a movie about Voyage of the Dawn Treader because it's a set of self-contained short stories. Right. It's true. There's no cohesive story. Hmm. So they pulled from the fourth book to give an overall thing. And the only thing that I don't like about it is their incessant need for Peter to have problems with the White Witch, hmm. which they throw into every movie, which is completely... It's kind of ridiculous. <laughs> They're trying to have like a central antagonist and push that concept. But it's been pretty weak because it shows up for one scene every movie and oh, does I, nothing. I agree. I'm so, not saying it's... I'm saying it's like, well, hey, remember I'm me? Just, <laughs> just like, that's kind of what they're trying to do. The antagonist, I like the characters yeah. in Voyage of the Dawn Treader. I like their plot and I like the way that they dealt with them. So I mm. think it actually works best out of the three movies. Hmm. Which, I mean, I kind of feel like I should go back and watch them because to be honest, um, I really haven't watched any of them You know, like seriously. I've had them kind of on in the background, so mm. I've never... Arguably, haven't watched any of them, depending on your definition of watching a film. <laughs> I, kind of, I have a, I have a friend that does that with movies, like movies that I consider very good, and I kind of get on his case for not actually mm-hmm. watching. For example, he'll, he's never seen Alien actually sitting down watching the entire movie, so I feel like I feel like he missed the entire experience. Yeah, second screening can be a detrimental to a movie. Yeah, it can. Um, yeah, but I, I the music did stand out so much so that I actually got the soundtrack for uh, Voyage of the Dawn Treader. Because mm-hmm. I like it so much. I, I like to listen to soundtracks when I'm working. Liam Neeson. He's mm-hmm. the reason to watch those movies. Oh, yeah? Yeah, the voice of Asgard. Mm-hmm. I really do like his voice. Yeah. He's got a yeah. really good voice. Although, to be fair, no one really explained to him that C.S. Lewis was a Christian. Mm-hmm. Because um, when he asked to explain um, what the symbol for Aslan was, he was like, uh, uh, it, just kind of a godlike thing. <laughs> the good goodness. The spirit of goodness. <laughs> you know? It's like, no, it's straight up Jesus. Yeah, it's like, <laughs> died, rose again, never mind. It's funny never because mind. that technically means that Luke Skywalker's father and grandfather are both lions. Does it? Darth Vader is voiced by James Earl Jones, who is uh-huh. Mufasa, and Liam Neeson is uh, Qui-Gon Jinn, his adoptive grandfather, who is technically who is also Aslan. So. What about Jake Lloyd? Where does Jake Lloyd fit into all this? I don't know that name. I don't know that, that name. That was the kid was the, in, in, in uh, some movie that I've never seen before. <laughs> <laughs> I don't. Um, I'm, I'm not going to touch that one. I have, I, I, I'm building. I'm actively building a chart that outlines all the ties in mm-hmm. between Star Wars and Lion King and mm. how their families interrelate. <laughs> because technically, Simba and Luke are uh, stepbrothers because they have the same father. Hmm. And I was trying to find a way. I thought I had figured it out because I thought that Alec Guinness played um, the father or the the uncle in Hamlet. Which would technically mean that... Um, in which adaptation? He, he's not. I messed oh, up. Oh. But mm-hmm. I thought I had tied that and I would tie him to Scar because that's basically... Right. Right. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it didn't. So. And so actually that chart might be relevant because Kingdom Hearts could theoretically have a Star Wars and Lion King crossover. Yeah, I'm waiting for that one. <laughs> but additionally, he did play Macbeth in mm-hmm. a very weird... Um, there, there's some weird scenes in that movie. But he plays Macbeth. Which technically makes him... Uh, so he is a Shakespearean actor. 
So since he's there and he's um, in a Shakespearean play, and Lion King is based on Shakespearean, it technically does relate that whole, and since he's also the evil guy, could loosely tie him to Scar, at which point you look and Alec Guinness plays Obi-Wan, who is played by Ewan McGregor as a kid, who is the nephew to Dennis Lawson, which is, which is Luke's the main man. So it's all... But how does it relate to Kevin Bacon? <laughs> <laughs> Within six degrees. Yeah, that's all that's, I know. I'm sure you're related to it in some way. Um, probably don't know who that is. <laughs> <laughs> uh, the, the guy from Tremors. He, he's the hollow which, man. Which guy in Tremors? Did you ever see Apollo 13? Yes, I did. Um, he was um, Schwartz. Unless I'm confusing him with somebody else. Am I? Ah, I remember. I the, might be, actually. The, the guy who played Beastmaster and Kevin Bacon, I must get him confused. So. I could be totally wrong. Well, one of them had a career after the 80s. And it was Kevin Bacon. Yeah. So that's, kind of <laughs> that's a good way to look that's at it. That's a good way to kind of re- remember which is which. <laughs> anyway, one day that family tree will be complete and it'll show up on the internet yeah. as a fancy infographic and make me millions. Woohoo! Which infographics make, don't make anybody any money. What are you talking about? all be taken by Disney. Mm. So. Well, that's that's true. They might pay you for it, though. Which no, is, they won't. No? They own the rights to it. They don't have to pay me anything. Right. Yeah. They'd probably they'd throw you a pittance. They own both Star Wars and The Lion King. They would not. They would send me a C and D, and then make their own version. That's right. <laughs> Which is what they did to Mark Hamill's beard, just so you know. Oh, yeah. Really? He, yeah, and they, he was growing one, and they said cease and desist, and then they forced him to, to grow a new one for the movie. I'm making this up. Yeah, of course. Yeah. yeah. Okay, it wasn't Schwartz. It was Swagger. Was the name? Okay. Yeah, Schwartz. <laughs> but but again, I'm not positive it was Kevin Bacon. So. Who was he in Tremors? Oh, he was a uh, 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 Valentine. That's like the protagonist? Or is he the crazy gun guy? No, no, no. He wasn't the crazy... That, that was the right. father from uh, Family Ties. Okay. But, um, no, he, he was one of the two work for hire men. Okay, got it, yeah. Yeah, he was the skinny guy with the hat. Okay. Who, who, who fell in love with the, the scientist. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, got it. You know, they actually made four of those. I've seen all of them. Yeah. Have you seen the series as well? I saw a couple episodes of it. My, they only made a couple episodes of yeah. it. Yeah. My main problem with it is that as you watch the movies... You get progressively less afraid of the ground. Yes. Um, that's why the fourth one is amazing, because it reinstitutes that fear of standing on Earth. Well, it's a prequel. Yeah, and it's great. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, the series was on um, Chiller. Right? I don't know if that... No, it was on Chiller. Well, we replayed on Chiller. Uh, do they even have that station anymore? For a while, there was a station known as Chiller. No, I've never that heard of that. That would replay old... Like, horror anthology series and that kind of stuff. So it had Tremors. It had the old... Um, you know, various, like, Twilight Zone and, and Tales of the Crypt, but it had a bunch of, like, the weird ones, too, like, um, Tales from the Dark Side or something weird like that, it was called. A whole bunch of weird things like that that were basically just knockoffs yeah, of Twilight yeah, yeah. Zone and, and, uh, Outer Limits and that kind of thing, but just sort of, like, mm-hmm. weird different versions that you may not have heard of. I used of. to stay up too late on Saturday night to watch Tales from the Dark Side. Yeah. 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 And then my parents started to roll me out of bed on Sunday morning. <laughs> it was pretty cool. That and like really bad versions of horror movies and sometimes knockoffs, mm-hmm. which is all Christmas themed apparently. <laughs> apparently, we've sort of gone off off track a little bit. Speaking but. of really bad movies and Christmas, mm. uh, I, I've just got to say that it is a holiday tradition in our house to watch Santa Claus versus the Martians Mystery Science Theater three thousand. <laughs> That's a good one. Um, you know, and 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 celebrate uh, the swayziest Christmas of all. <laughs> it's Mm. It's good stuff. Good stuff. Have you seen, uh, while we're on the topic of bad Christmas movies, have you seen Santa Claus? The movie? Santa it's Claus? Santa Claus. Also a mystery it's science mystery theater. Si- yeah, yeah, when he battles the devil, it's like the Mexican... It's the classic yeah. battle of Santa Claus versus Santa the Claus devil. Santa Claus versus the devil. Yeah. <laughs> and in that one, by the way, Santa Claus is Big Brother, like you were describing. Yeah, he, has he really is. this giant telescope with like eyes at the end. Uh-huh. And he sees everyone. He knows what's it's happening. A, it's a Mexican movie. So, and the telescope, <laughs> the telescope eye at the end does blink. If I remember, it's very yes, creepy. it does. It's terrifying. And then he has all, and he also has children from around the world that work as his slaves. Slaves, yes. Uh, building the toys. Like they're, elves. They're, mm-hmm. Yeah, they're, they're not really, really bad elves. singers they're, too. <laughs> it's actually kind of disturbing. Are you sure you're not talking about Charlie and the Chocolate Factory? <laughs> <laughs> the remake or the original? The original. The original. Yeah. Was, I, I haven't seen the remake. I, yeah. Not a no, not a fan. So yeah. Yeah. Well, they were originally... Weren't the Oompa Loompas originally slaves in the book? No, no, they were freed. 
Like he he found them oh, okay. and he employed them. <laughs> The, you're free yeah. working my factory. Like, yeah, <laughs> if I remember correctly, he said something along those lines, like I found them and like I hired them, brought them here, and <laughs> you, you're it you're sounds, free to go, but you don't want to go. It sounds suspiciously like sharecropping. Yeah, Dumbledore did the same thing with the house elves at uh, Hogwarts. Mm. So, you know, don't elves pass are, too much judgment. Elves are an unrepresented minority, I think. And yeah, it they sounds are. like they're. They are. Yeah. We need a Christmas game that sort of addresses the uh, <laughs> the Christmas elves, not the. Not the big elves, like mm-hmm. all the, the the tall elves, like the Legolas and mm-hmm. all of them. They're treated well, but the tiny Christmas elves are—they <laughs> never get their due. Mm. They have to work in factories and build shoes and. Well, yeah, but they like it. The stop go animation. Do they? Do, yeah. That's that's those are stories written by big people. Am I am I racist? <laughs> am I speciesist? <laughs> in, in my version, they were all uh, orphans that Santa adopted. Oh, there or, you go. Not adopted, but uh, bought. Like, <laughs> Rescue. <laughs> Rescue. At least one. That's the plot of Oliver Twist, isn't it? <laughs> in, that, in that stop go animation, uh, stop motion animation, Rudolph the, uh, Rudolph saves Christmas thing. Mm-hmm. You have that that one elf who wants to be a dentist, and he makes yeah, it. Yeah, that's so true. That's a good point. Oh, yeah. You get your yeah. one hero. We're good. We're yeah, good. We, we don't have to one. do anything. Oh, we're guys. We win. <laughs> it was in the 1960s. We got it. We got it. Yeah, we're done. Uh, <laughs> oh, fantastic though. Uh, so do you guys have any more uh, sort of like last minute Christmas thoughts here before we start wrapping up? Just that the Jewish kids have it good because they get twelve gifts. Mm. Yeah, I don't know. My the Jewish the Jewish friends that I had actually got would get kind of annoyed when I would say that to them because then they would go, "No, we don't. Our gifts are terrible." <laughs> get like you know, like a notebook and like a like a protractor. <laughs> <Wow>. <laughs> well, those are my those are my twelve gifts. Uh, it's like, wow, I'm sorry. All right, fair enough. Fair enough. <laughs> I don't know, maybe I'm sure there's some out there that get great gifts, I don't know. But clearly we've identified a a gaping hole mm-hmm. in video games. I think so, yeah. Uh, I think that there's a lot to be mined here. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I mean, we, have, we haven't even uh, touched the topic of uh, Hanukkah games. No, it's so. true. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I think I played one of those. I think there's an iPhone game or a, a, just an Android game that's uh, just dreidel. Mm. Um, whatever that game is actually called, I don't want to try because I'll Horribly mispronounce it. I think you're right, actually. Yeah, I, I kind of. I think it's I saw the same thing. thing. Mm. Yeah, come to think of it. Mm. Although that's almost you say kind dreidel, of. I say dreidel. You know, <laughs> it's, I say tomato. It's I say almost tomato. kind of like <laughs> cheating because it's like it's a different game unto itself that is associated with yeah. the Hanukkah season. So it's kind of. But I. But yeah, that's probably the closest. I mean, that's I think closer than what we have for Christmas, really. That's uh, yeah. Do you really think about it? Mm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, but you're right. There's not really a whole lot aside from having certain Christmas levels and Christmas themes and Christmas missions, like the ones that we've talked about, I think we kind of hit all the, the big points that mm-hmm. we're going to come up with. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah, there is kind of a gaping hole, and I think North Pole Tycoon, mm-hmm. um, if you want to support it on Kickstarter, <laughs> <laughs> it's going to happen. It, it should happen. Next year, I'm backward compatible with Kwanzaa games. Yeah. The first tier <laughs> reward, if you donate $10, you're given the opportunity to donate five more free of charge. Ooh. At tier 15, uh, 15 $20, um, you can also donate $5 in mm-hmm. addition, and we'll send you a thank you card um, <laughs> through email. So, <laughs> When do they get to work in Santa's factory <laughs> for free? They get, to, they get to purchase the right to work in a factory. Oh, yeah, yeah. At, at, if, you, if you donate $200, one of the elves has your face. <laughs> no, Pledge. Yeah. You just have to send us a picture so that we can cut it out. Like, put it in the... Oh, that would never go wrong. Pledge Pledge yeah. will send you legitimate pictures all the time. Pledge five thousand dollars, and you can be the one to come to our studio, quote unquote, and uh, <laughs> send all the deliverables that we have when uh, yeah. uh, the uh, the pledge rewards. Make us coffee as well. Yes. At, yes. One, uh, at uh, five hundred dollars, you actually get to do the coding for us. <laughs> <laughs> Just make it for us at this point. <laughs> Excellent. Cool. Well, thank you everyone for joining us for uh, Backward Compatible Podcast number nineteen, the Christmas special. Uh, hope you have enjoyed it, and we hope you have a wonderful holiday season. Merry Christmas, Happy Hanukkah, and Kwanzaa, and all that other fun stuff. So, I'm Chris. Hello. Oh, I'm Jim, and I'd also like to wish you all a, a merry Festivus. Festivus uh, with the rest no, of us, just in case. That. Yes. Yeah, right. <laughs> and, and I'm hungry, but you can call me Doc. <laughs> and uh, thank you for joining us. We'll see you next time. We want you to join the discussion on our website backward-compatible.com This time, share your favorite holiday games or content and what else you'd like to see in the future. Happy holidays. Until next time, stay compatible.